We have had probably one of the most stimulating days that I have had personally in a very long time today. I think some of the um, discussions we've had, some of the territories we've entered and explored, and quite frankly, I could listen to Ken Cooper all day, all right? Um, but what I'm most excited about in this next discussion is that technical knowledge is great. Mm -hmm. Knowing the ethics and the rules of journalism is important. But let's face it, a lot of us are doing this because of passion. We have a passion for the issues mm -hmm. that we care about and that we write about and report about. So that when I first saw, I think I saw you on Twitter, Simone, is where, how I met you and then looked into your body of work and, and uh, decided, I want to get to know this person. By the end of our first Zoom call, I was convinced that this woman it lives, breathes, and, and <coughs> crime is her thing, all right? It's, it's, it's what like she, law no, enforcement. Almost, law enforcement is her <laughs> thing. Uh, Simone has, has had a, a long career as a local reporter. She has also worked for, you helped start the Marshall Project. Yeah, I'll start. And she's now with NBC Universal. And so we thought, what a great way to end a long, packed day with someone with, who brings the enthusiasm and the energy about the beat that she covers. And to, to give us some tips about how to build a beat, how to connect with sources, and how to make impact in that way. So take it away, Simone. Thank you. Hello, everyone. And I say shout out fellow NBC News person. <laughs> um, so how to build a beat, an intro to specialized reporting. So I'll start off with who am I? Like, why did Rachel ask me to do this? Um, so I've been covering law enforcement since two, well, actually, I was an intern in 2001. But I would say full time since 2003, although I always say I look 12. I'm really old. I'm 40. So um, I've covered local cops for full time, the paper in Philadelphia, the New York Daily News. Then I was hired by the Marshall Project before it was the Marshall Project. It wasn't even a logo when I started there. And I was the first and only police reporter there for a very long time. And then after George Floyd, people were like, oh, there's actually people out there who really dig into police reform and why policing is so hard to fix. So then I jumped to NBC News investigation seven months ago. So I'm really new to the world of TV and print merged together, which is NBC these days. So I have the expertise of you know, covering cops, like going to crime scenes, seeing dead people on the street and stuff like that, to the more sort of academic type work I do now, which is using FOIA and data, which we're going to get to. So it's also a good example how a beat you know, changes over time. Like you can start off as a cub reporter doing something and then 10 years doing something else that's still on this beat, but right to say way more nerdier. So um, this image is a pile of trash. And this comes from Reginald Stewart, for those of us in the room who had ties to then Knight Ritter. It's Miami Herald, the paper in Philadelphia. Reggie Stewart was a really known editor in that world. So I had showed him my presentation last night, and he insisted that I include this pile of trash to show you guys. And I was like, why? Because when I wanted to talk about what is a beat, the image I had used was just a press conference. Like, I'm a police reporter, so a police chief talking to reporters. And so I'm going to talk to what Reggie has to say. That as journalists, especially if you work in an outlet that covers sports and entertainment and business and the Pentagon and the White House, we just like pour in information to our editors. And it, he said, being an editor himself, it's like a pile of trash. It's just people telling you a bunch of stuff, and you have to lay out a paper or put a segment together. And it's just like all this stuff going on all the time which is why you rely on your beat reporters, because we're the ones who know, like, hmm, that, I think that looks like a red book back over there. Like, that red backpack, is that a story? Is that blue piece of computer, is that a story? It's our job to take all this information and figure out what is a story, and in my case, what's a good investigative project, how to move this forward. So the cool thing about having a beat is also an expertise. My background um, academically is I have a graduate degree in criminology, which is why I had jumped to the Marshall Project to begin with, because they were hiring at the time people who are lawyers and journalists or have a experience in higher education and are journalists, not just journalists. So I always tell people, if you really fall in love with something in reporting, whether it's environmental science, whether it's crime, whether it's you know, covering politics, I know and I always feel that academics hate when I say this. I personally don't understand why people get master's degrees in journalism. I think it's very much something you can do. I have it like that for a reason, because I'm going to show you guys a video in a second. Um, 
it's very much a specialized uh, thing to do. And so to me, you can learn on the job. I personally don't see the need to go into Columbia School of J. That's just my opinion. What do I know? But I do think it, it matters more to get that expertise. Because I think when you speak to sources who are highly specialized, and you're covering health, and you're covering the pandemic, why don't we have journalists who have backgrounds in biology, or perhaps who are doctors and decide to become journalists? I think it makes you better informed to have that higher academic level and be a writer and be a producer. That's just my two cents, but I'm a part of that club. So um, I wanted to ask you guys, let's name some beats, because I was going to list out some non-traditional beats, but I figured you guys are hip and cool. What are some beats these days that you maybe a few years ago wouldn't have been beats? Climate. Yes. Diversity. That's an interesting beat, because I know I used to be a DNI helping my organization grow in DNI, not covering it. So that's very much true. Yeah. Social media and information. Yep, NBC's big on that. Reproductive justice. Domestic terrorism. I heard somebody earlier say like, the intersection between culture and sports, and we've had a reporter like, why would we do that? So I think that's kind of interesting. Yeah, the undefeated, I think, is a whole outlet, right? Cater to that. I thought of um, the marijuana beat. The Denver Post was one of the first, and Iowa states are legalizing marijuana. That's a big thing. Also, the dark web. So again, covering law enforcement, I now I don't have experience in Telegram, but you better learn it quick because that's the way we're going. So just you know, when I started off in my day, I'm old, you thought of beats as like city hall, policing, education, politics, these White House, these sort of core beats in media that's been around forever. But as the world changes, beat reporting is definitely changing as fast as you know we can hold our hats to, especially with technology. When we think about the war in Ukraine right now, just understanding like I didn't even know until reading coverage. There's a privatization of um, satellite imagery. So if you're a reporter who's been covering the intersection of um, private tech and you know, DOD, you probably know what's going on. So I thought that's just really interesting that as tech takes hold, there's just so many, many beats unfolding. So just, you know, I know when I was coming up, police reporting was seen as like the crappy beat, the beat that you only, why would you want to do this, or a starter out beat. But as someone who's been on it now 17 years, I can tell you, it literally takes you to the halls of the White House where they negotiate you know, executive orders on things to policing, to DOJ, all the way down to your local police department. So it's very much intertwined with politics, money, like we saw the explosion with George Floyd. But all these things were bristling from the beginning. So just because you're like, you get education, especially now with school boards, right, being sort of the hot front issue now with politics, don't say, oh man, I'm stuck with schools. No, actually, it's really, really cool. So I had a friend of mine at the time who was at the New York Times, and she was signed the Bronx. And she's like, oh, man, I got the Bronx. Boo. I grew up in New York. I was like, you got the Bronx? Do you know Rikers is technically in the Bronx? Like, I would love that beat, because then you could really focus on Rikers. And this was 12, 15 years ago before Rikers was really in the news. So again, just because you're stuck with a beat, you will find your gold. There will be something there. Don't, no, don't despair. OK. <laughs> so you're assigned a beat, now what? So I put a list together of um, like what makes up a beat. So obviously, it's a government agency. So in my case, the police department or DOJ. Um, I put former officials who aren't shy. So I'm going to give you some tips on how to get sourced. So um, a good beat reporter, which I'm going to get into in the next slide, don't rely on the people currently in charge. They're obviously not going to give you information unless they want the information out in the media for a reason. And if they do, you always have to ask yourself why. Like, what's this thing? Someone handholds, like, here's this big report. You know, why are you getting this report? So I love to find people who are retired. My sort of go-to person who's retired, who usually will talk, is the person who left their government job for academia. Because now if they're like a professor, you know, especially an adjunct professor because they're an expertise master on something, they usually will talk on record. And they usually have a good idea how that government agency was working and the flaws. And if you're someone who wants to go into academia, you are pushing reform. You're probably like excited to talk about it. So I have a lot of success finding people, in my case, who worked in law enforcement, who become law professors or just adjunct criminal justice professors. They usually will talk about the subject you're asking about. Again, academics will study the topic. So when I was at UPenn, the reason why I went there, it was a school that focuses on police departments. And you actually will be assigned a police department as a, a graduate student to help research. So a lot of um, professors, Yale's one, U Chicago's one, in my world in policing, they actually will get contracts from police departments and study them and look at the data, get the files, and usually could work with the professor on that subject matter to understand what they're doing. And they can also give you information that a police department usually won't give you. 
So um, like I said, I do policing, environmental science, reproductive rights. I am sure there's a professor out there studying that topic. And if you work with that person, they usually will help you sort of develop a bigger project. So I always love them. Community activists pushing for reform. And that can mean anything. So in policing, obviously, Black Lives Matter. I was thinking of sports reporting. Those who are pushing for reform in terms of concussions and players, and a lot of the players getting hurt tend to be black players and not white players. So you know, there's a whole world of activism. Definitely tap into that world. But I always want to push to young reporters. When activists, you talk to them, don't treat them like the gospel, like activists have an agenda too. So always fact check what they say. And I know, especially in the term of George Floyd, being a police reporter, I got a lot of crap for questioning the activists. So one of the stories I did, which got a lot of play at the Marshall Project, was why defunding was not a silver bullet. I was probably one of the first mainstream journalists to be like, no, nah, I don't think this is going to work. Because I did a big story a couple years ago looking at police shortages and found when you actually cut a police budget, they're not cutting from patrol, they're cutting from specialized units, which tend to be community policing, or units that try to tamp down on police violence by building bridges with communities. They cannot cut patrol, they just can't. They have to answer 911 calls. So I made this whole argument that once you um, start cutting from patrol, because this happened after the recession, this actually has been studied, you saw a correlation between um, police abuse and overworked cops. So that's what, we actually did a lot of research on this, so that's why felt really passionately about that subject. So again, just because activists were calling for defund, someone who actually studied what happens when you defund police, which again happened in 08 and 09 after the Great Recession, is actually not the greatest um, outcomes, especially for outcomes for communities of color. And then lobbying organizations. So all organizations, don't think lobbyists in terms of just like who's here in Washington. You also have lobbying organizations who are like management. So I've been doing a lot of work in the federal law enforcement sphere. One of my sources, is the head of like the Federal Managers Association for Law Enforcement. But he actually connects with all the supervisors and like FBI, US Marshals. So for me, he's a great source because he's just like plugged into what all the supervisors think. But I could tell you I never knew there was a Federal Managers Association until a couple years ago. So really look out for who are these like obscure organizations. Like when I was at the Daily News, I had to deal with the nurses union a lot. And the nurses union actually has a great data arm. So when I was at the Daily News, like 2010s-ish, and we had, let's say, like a surge in a certain illness, like before COVID, they actually can track like what hospitals are seeing what. They can give you access to the nurses. So again, you would be like, nurses union, what? But it actually is really helpful in getting access on things. So it's always good to know, like, who are these organizations out there that want their members out in front? And members being, you know, the establishment, the people who work for government, or the person who's, you know, I don't know, working with the Pentagon. Like, you'll be surprised that if you move away from sort of the top shelf organizations, sort of these second and third tier organizations, who they are and how they can help you interview people. And I also find, because if you're dealing with the government, there are a lot of unions involved. The unions want to put their members out there. So we did a story at the Marshall Project in conjunction with NBC News looking at um, police use of violence, sending people to the hospital just after a rough arrest. And believe it or not, I got a lot of information in that story through the nurses union in San Jose, because they were the ones really saying, hey, we don't want to take hurt people to the jails. Like, let them stay in the hospitals longer, because it turned out the nurses union actually worked with the nurses in the jail. So it's really complicated, but it really helped me flesh out that story. Cops don't want to talk about, yeah, we're beating people and kicking them, but the nurses will talk about it. So there you go. You can also sort of think, like, if I have this subject, who's here around the subject and who's here around the subject and how are they all connected? Because you'll be surprised of all of the sort of the connections and maybe you know, the school's superintendent won't talk to you, but maybe there's a, some organization out there who's like tied to the superintendent who will. And then um, I'm gonna get into FOIA in a second and why that's also important. So government agencies, I wanna hold spiel about that. And I said this in the beginning of our conversation, Never just rely on the spokespeople. So when I was at the New York Daily News, I sat what we call in the shack. When you're in New York City covering policing, all the major news outlets sit in police headquarters. You don't go in the newsroom every day. You're going to one police plaza. It's on the second floor. And I would say lazy reporters would go upstairs. That's where their press office was. And if there was something going on, they would like interview the sergeant as a source. And in, in the paper the next day, it will be, police sources say this. And we knew amongst ourselves who were the reporters who were really sourced and actually talking to cops on the street versus you're lazy and just going to speak to the press office. So I always say, and that like really infuriated me because they're just pushing the department line. So I always give this example. When I was a young night cops reporter at the Daily News in the shack by myself, because you know who else is there at 10 o'clock at night but like a 25-year-old reporter, 
with the cops. I had gotten a call that, um, that there was a police-involved shooting. This is before Twitter. This is around 2009, so this is before 2022 and how you would catch this. And it was stable condition. The person shot like in the leg. And my job, being a night cops reporter, was to then tell my city editor, should we send a runner to the scene? Because again, we didn't have video. This is before you just pull out your phone. I'm like a dinosaur telling the story. So it's my job like to use discretion. So at this point, I was getting sourced. I was going out to police parties. I was talking to cops, trying to figure out the 411, you know, what's going on on the ground. So I talked to a guy in Queens. And I go, hey, this crime scene in whatever neighborhood it was, you know, it's coming across as stable. I'm just curious, should I send a reporter? And he's like, hell yeah, he's paralyzed from the neck down. And when you go to the PIO, he's like, no, it's stable. And then the PIO will say, well, I don't get information as fast as the guys on the ground. You know, it, they have to call it, and it goes up their chain of command before it goes to the PIO, before they tell the reporters anyway. Fine, I don't know. But I always tell that story because early on, I like, figured out, like, don't listen to the PIO, right? They don't want the story the next day. They, they want it, a box in the story and move on, you know? So, um, and again, I, that was my second point. Especially someone covering policing, or if you're doing environmental science, you have to deal with chemical companies, or any sort of bad guy in the room type of beat. My best stories come from other cops, or people in federal law enforcement who want to out problems. My stories don't come from activists, they come from fed up police chiefs, fed up federal agents, people on the ground who see this firsthand, who really, to me, their only spin is that they have this job that they feel thankless and no one cares about, trying to make the world a safer place, and they're really mad at like their department or their agency. And I find those stories, you know, when it, and they can sort of spell it out for me on a silver platter, like why is this policy broken? Why are they not following department rules? Why in some cases they're breaking the law? So I always say cultivate people in your source world who so-called is the bad guy, because that's how you get your whistleblowers. And if they trust you to come forward, then they will start passing your name around to everyone else. So I've been doing this a long time, so it's not that hard for me these days to get someone on the phone who maybe won't talk to local reporters, but they'll talk to me because someone else in DC said, call Simone, because I've known her like 15 years. And I think that's um, how you're able to break a lot of more in-depth pieces, because once you move up the chain in the world and you're doing investigative and more long-term stories, it takes us six, eight months to develop stories. So I can't think of an idea that I would get beat on. You really have to think of things that no one can scoop you on, and the only way to do that is with sources. Because you have to really think of stories that it's not on anyone's radar, seriously, because you will get scooped. Because it takes us so long to put them together. So it's very important, I think, to build trust, not just with the communities you're dealing with, but also the government entity or the so-called bad guy, the chemical company, because you need them just as much as you need the activists. I feel a good journalist, we are impartial. We're able to see all the players. So let's say you work at a government agency, which we all know is broken, which we all know is screwed up. It'd be great to have like a whistleblower to say, you know, in this classroom, it's one teacher for 50 kids. There was an internal memo that went out. Everyone ignored the memo. It's great for you as a journalist to get that memo, for example. So it's very important, I think, um, to really go out there. So the one example I did, this is before COVID, in the early days, is the NYPD, when I covered them, they have all these fraternal organizations. So they have Guardians, which is for black low-level officers. They have Noble, which is for captain and above. There's the same thing for Latino officers. I'm black and Jewish. I went to the Jewish officer group. I went to the Latino officer group because I look Latino. I just use every card I had. No, seriously, I, didn't, I have zero shame. I didn't care. And you just show up, and the t as time goes on, they're like, oh, Simone, I want to leak that. Oh, Simone, because she's cool. And really, that's all I did. I just started going to parties and like talking to people. And I don't, I don't know how the chemical companies of the world work, but I could tell you law enforcement definitely has a lot of um, internal organizations with a lot of schmoozy events, and I'm always happy to go to them, because A, you learn stuff, but B, they know who you are. So I think that's very important. And um, my, I have a whole section dedicated to FOIA. I guess you guys all know what FOIA is, because you guys are working journalists, which I think is super important, and I wish when I was a younger reporter, someone sat me down to really learn FOIA. I really didn't use the breath of FOIA until the Marshall Project. And I you know, worked in newsrooms when I was coming up that FOIA was only for like investigative reporters. They weren't teaching younger reporters, which is not a hard thing to teach someone. It's super important for democracy. So I always believe everyone should know about FOIA. So I'm going to get to that in a second. And also be persistent. Keep asking questions. So especially when you're an investigative reporter and you're doing something they don't want you to write about or they're not giving you your documents, you just have to keep calling them. That's it. 
And until they give you a firm no comment, like, and you go, okay, that's what I'm going to report, are you sure? Just keep calling them. You know, if I'm annoying, whatever, who cares, right? We're just doing our job. And like, I don't get offended. I have colleagues of mine who get really mad if someone hangs up the phone or really mad if someone argues with them. And I always say, it's like, um, you know, they're not arguing with us, they're arguing with our press badge. Like, they don't know me, they don't know Simone and her puppy Ezra, like, they don't know my life, <laughs> right? They know me, the NBC reporter. So if someone loses their temper at me, which they do, I'm just like, whatever, like, they don't know me, right? So just like, you know, cops get shit for exploding and yelling at people back, I think as reporters, when someone blows up at you, and I learned this trick when I was an intern in the Washington Post from, like, the old-time uh, rewrite guy, Marty Weil, um, you just call him back on the phone really calmly, like, hey, we lost our connection. <laughs> But I was trying to tell you and just pretend that nothing happened. That's it, because there's no point of you getting it with them, especially as I learned coming from the Marshall Project, which you know doesn't have a huge name recognition like NBC News. At NBC News, that's the last thing you want is to get an argument oh, give me a second, with like a source or someone who's being confrontational, because A, they could put that on Twitter, and then your boss would be like, what did you just do? And then B, it insults your whole entire huge organization. So now that I'm in like a super name brand organization, you really have to watch what you say. You really have to watch your tone of your emails because you don't want to come across like too political on a thought, too biased on a thought. Because in all seriousness, if someone leaked your email where you're going off about President Trump or whatever, and that makes it out there, that's not good for you or your organization. So you have to be very careful as you like move up the ranks in your more high profile position to know you don't just represent yourself, you also represent your agency or your organization, so watch out. You got a question, I'm gonna show a video, yes. How do you build up that trust with your sources to also maintain that professional contact with them so it doesn't veer into becoming a personal contact? That's a great contact? question, great question. I think, especially for women, um, being a female police reporter or a female politics reporter, there is a lot of sexual harassment. I think more when I was younger, I think now, they're like, you're old, we'll leave you alone. But I definitely, and when I covered the NYPD, I had cops send me pictures of their lower body parts and all that. And I told my boss, and it was up to my boss whether to report it or not, and then my boss, who was female at the time, said no, because if we report it, then it shows you're going to lunch with like top brass, and then all the top brass won't talk to you. So we don't think we should report it, and they didn't, but okay. Um, and I think at the end, years later, she's right. Like if I reported it, then I would have, it would have been like, everyone's, going to lunch with Simone, and then she's snitching on us. And I think as time went on, what I learned to tell people is if, number one, why are you telling me this? And if it's because you're trying to sleep with me, then I would tell them, like, keep your information, I don't care. Which cops, I mean, they will try to do that. I don't know about now, but when I was coming up, definitely. Um, and the same with my friends who cover, cover politics. Politics is another place that's a very hard place to be a woman. Um, from just talking to my friends. I think there's more rampant sexual harassment covering politics and policing just based on my friend circle and like hearing what they went through. But nonetheless, I think you have to lay out why are they giving you the information and then be like you're on the same team in, in terms of you know uncovering corruption and uncovering abuse. Like our goal is about accountability and transparency. So when I had people, again, more in my younger career, not now, an investigative reporter for NBC News, but my youth, I would try to figure out why they were coming to me, what they wanted, and if there was some sort of, another reason why people would try to leak me stories, they were like mad at their commander. So if like their commander, I don't know, was stopping too many people at red lights and they really hated that guy, they might give me some report to make the commander look bad. And then I would just tell my editor, like, hey, they're giving me this report because they're really blah, 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 and let my editor decide what to do with it. I'm a big proponent of always tell your editor so even today, I'm working on a project, and someone said, off record, this, this, and this. And I know I'm not to tell my boss. And I know as a reporter, when you tell your boss, it sort of like, I know, like sort of gives them a bias in how to frame a story. But then I feel if I don't tell him, and you know, this off record tip happens, then I look like the idiot, so I have to tell him. But I, I'm a big believer. Tell your higher ups, because you yourself don't want to get jammed up. But as far as just building the sources, it's trying to just be like, we're on the same team of truth and accountability. That's what I do. And try to find people who agree with me. If you are sort of like a grimy human, I, it's not worth it in the end. So I'm going to show you this video. Speaking of sources, um, 
when I was a young reporter in Philadelphia, it's like 2004, he was a police lieutenant. And he was one of the first, I guess, police lieutenants who let me come to his office. He would let me go through the files. And then years later, I met a policing conference for uh, police chiefs, and we're on the line to get tuna fish sandwiches. And I was like, Mike Chitwood, what are you doing here? And he's like, I just got elected sheriff. And I was like, you? So he is, no, seriously, I was like, you, you're crazy, because you'll see, he is crazy. So he's from Philly. His dad was also a police chief in the Philly suburbs. They were always on TV. They have a thick Philly accent. He gets himself elected in northern Florida right after Trump. This is a county, I later learned, um, desegregated schools in 1970, like way past Brown v. Ed. This is a school, a, a place where um, they had the black downtown and the white downtown. And not too long ago, I couldn't go to the white downtown. It was a place like stuck in time, if you will, of the South. And I'm a New Yorker, multicultural New Yorker, and I'm just like, what's up with y'all down here? Y'all crazy. Um, so seriously, it was like a place that was like from a movie. It was just like things you learn about in the schools. But like, I've never seen a relic of Jim Crow South. Like, I'm a second generation New Yorker. I just never saw it and people didn't want to talk about it. I went to the historical museum tr to get photos of like the colors only water fountain because we worked with PBS NewsHour as you'll see and we needed images. And they said, how dare you come in here asking such a rude question? Like we're embarrassed of our past. And I was like, mm -hmm. like she was like really mean. And I was like, but you're the historical society. So she threw me out. So I did not get the photos from her. Anyway, so he gets himself elected. And then I'm gonna curse a little bit. So on the, I was like, how did you do that? You're like from Philly, you're a Democrat. Like how did you do this? And he goes, he explains me his answer. And I was like, wow, didn't your county win Trump? And he goes, yeah, but fuck Donald Trump. And I was like, will you say fuck Donald Trump on record? And he's like, yes, I will. And I was like, eh. So we pitched him. And um, the Marshall Project, we co-published. So it was our first um, TV uh, collaboration we did. And it turned into an eight-minute um, TV piece for NewsHour. I did the written piece. But as you'll hear, there's a lot of reporting that went involved. That's just it's TV, so it's, it's not really tied to attribution, but a lot of it I got from um, public records, going through his campaign finance, going through like the police data we did have at the time. So I'm just going to show this to you as an example that as you rise the ranks in your industry, your sources do too. So, you know, Lieutenant, 15 years ago, I was a kid cop reporter, and look at us now. So. How are you doing? How are you, sir? Good to see you. Whether he's at his favorite bar late into the night, or a church service the next morning, Sheriff Mike Chitwood is a familiar face across Volusia County in eastern Florida, a sprawling section of the state best known for both its beaches and NASCAR's Daytona 500. It was also one of the last places in the South to end segregation. This excuse for a human being. Blunt and often profane, Chitwood is a constant presence on local news. There's some real sick scumbags. You're looking at a bunch of scumbags. Who knows who this scumbag is? We need Mike Chitwood. A passionate the 54-year-old political independent is both pro-gun and pro-immigrant, and he's been endorsed by the NRA and the NAACP. Thank you. Because on the news. Thank you. We yes. love that you just say what you're feeling. And since taking office last year, He's publicly feuded with nearly everyone who has questioned his vision. If I don't get reelected, I really don't give a shit. I am going to do my job of what I was elected to do. What I was elected to do was bring progressive change to the county. That change has come by deploying a statistical crime tracking strategy popular in many cities called Comstat. Why do we have two sets of numbers? And he's moved away from a focus on weapons training toward a policy of de-escalation. He's also ordered an independent study of all recent officer-involved shootings and mandated that his deputies keep their body cameras on when responding to a call. Everything we do uh, is not about kicking in front doors and dragging people out by the scruff of their neck. Statistically, you know, it's 80% of the crimes are committed by 15 to 20% of the, of the same people over and over and over again. That, that means the general population, the people that you come in contact with every day are not criminals. Chitwood's career began as a beat cop in Philadelphia, where he spent several years investigating homicides. He eventually moved to Florida to become the police chief of Daytona Beach, a job he held for more than a decade before he ran for sheriff. You're described as bullheaded, as stubborn, as brash, as offensive. You, you know, it's difficult to manage the way that you're managing. Can't you tone it down a little bit? If you don't like the fact that we're going to put sanctity of human life first and we're going to switch from a warrior mentality to a guardian mentality, then I think you need to go. Because, because the day of being a warrior and policing your community like you're a warrior, 
that's the past. Last August, however, the Trump administration rolled back restrictions on giving military equipment to local police, and President Trump has struck a far different tone on policing. Please don't be too nice. Chitwood says during extreme weather events like hurricanes, Volusia County has utilized surplus military vehicles, and he applauds the president for making more available. On most days, you'll find him riding his bike. How you doing tonight? We tagged along as he rode through the mostly low-income neighborhood of Spring Hill in the city of DeLand, where he stopped to talk with residents about recent crimes. We have an idea of what happened, but we need a few more witnesses to get us to where we need to go to make an arrest. We had a homicide here a week ago, uh, right up here at this house. There was some type of an altercation with a homeless man. Uh, when the altercation ended, somebody pulled out a gun and shot him the homeless man five times. You're in a pair of shorts and you're riding your bike in what people would consider to be a dangerous neighborhood looking for a killer. Correct. Does that sound kind of strange to you? It may sound strange to people who don't do this for a living, but for those of us who do it for a living, it's the norm. It's a philosophy known as community or neighborhood policing, and Chitwood is a firm believer. So something like Ferguson? Where, where the police showed up and fired tear gas and looked like a military or a war zone. That's yeah. not appropriate? Ferguson didn't just happen. Ferguson was 10 years in the making. And it took that one incident. That one incident is what sparked everything. Where maybe, had they engaged in a little bit more community involvement, had they been part of the community as opposed to apart from it, Ferguson might not have happened. Chitwood also strongly disagrees with the Trump administration's crackdown on illegal immigration. Earlier in the year, amid heightened fears within immigrant communities, racial profiling is unacceptable. He reached out to the estimated 10 to 20,000 undocumented residents in Volusia County, an area that has long been dependent on migrant labor. The sheriff made it clear that he doesn't want his deputies seen as agents from ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement. You are in a county that went for Trump. I mean, Trump ran on tough immigration policy, a border wall going after anybody who doesn't have papers? Are you thumbing your nose at, at constituents in this county? If you're a criminal, if there is a warrant out for your arrest, no matter who you are, we're coming to get you. But we're not gonna be proactively going out and be uh, immigration officers. I, I believe that, that just, that's not what our job as local state and county uh, and, and municipal law enforcement officers is. Chitwood says breaking up families doesn't make sense to him. And he points to the fact that three of his own deputies, Roy, Daniel, and Billy Galarza, were raised by undocumented parents near Pearson, Florida. Their father, Pantaleon Galarza, has worked as a fern picker since coming to the United States from Mexico in 1980. He came into this country without papers. I know that he's, he's gotten his legal status since then, but you don't have any, any question or any shame about the fact that he entered in illegally? No, I'm very proud of my dad. I am here because of him, because he, he helped us. The times when I needed to get to school, there are times I didn't have money, I'd always call, hey, I need some gas money. But he was there, he was there for me. When it comes to patrolling the surrounding community, the Galarza brothers say they simply follow the protocol laid out by their boss. The majority of this community, the way it's growing, there's a lot of people that don't have papers, but that's not up to me to determine if they should be here or not. You know, until they commit a crime and I need to act on it, so be it. And until they do commit a crime, they commit a felony, and they're in prison for some other reason, they'll eventually get deported back to Mexico. Chitwood's office says crime is down by more than 20% since he took office. Okay, stand by for one minute, all right? But critics like former Volusia County legal advisor John McConnell say that Chitwood is padding the books when it comes to certain property crimes like auto theft. It's logical that he should show a fairly good drop because he's changed the way that he changed the rules of the game. It's changed the way you keep score. It's a legal padding, though. You know, is it ethically right? Is it morally right? That's the question. If I live in this neighborhood, I want to know if there were 35 or 40 burglary, car burglaries instead of them say, hey, you had a car burglary the other night. And I say, well, that's no big deal. Every now and then you have one of those. You're just here for moral support? Yes. All right. But Chitwood says he's not hiding anything and that he has another three years before voters will decide if he should keep his job. Everything going well? Yeah. Good. Before we left, we met him back at the bar after he finished filming his local news segment dubbed Scumbag of the Week. You like that term? I do. I do. It, it adds uh, a little panache. 
to what we're looking for. And and I think it's there's a lot of people in the world that want to say that, but they're like, oh my God, it's not politically correct. Me, I'm not politically correct. I'm a bull in a china shop. I'll admit that. I have the least political skills of anybody you'll ever meet. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Well, some believe Chitwood will seek higher office one day. He says he has no intention of turning in his badge anytime soon. I've been here almost a year. We've had two so far. I'm John Carlos Frey of The Marshall Project, reporting for the PBS NewsHour in Volusia County, Florida. So I know we're running out of time, so I'll just go quickly about FOIA. So this story, um, you can't really tell by the script, but that was a very public record Z story. So he, you know, said, I'm doing all these cool, neat things. So it's looking at um, campaign finance records that I saw that he got endorsement from the NRA and the NAACP, for example. Um, looking at his relationship with the community. You know, he said, you know, I'm protecting them, whatever he had to say. But when you looked at the way, you know, they were keeping their records, there's a lot of issues of how you record traffic stops based on race, which what he was doing. Um, <clears throat> as you saw, we had the example of him cooking the books when it came to, like, crime definitions. So although it seems like, oh, this is, like, a fun feature, it actually took a lot of investigative reporting to get to that point because we didn't want to just make him look like he thinks he's awesome, you know, it's not our job to believe him, right? So instead of, and I did a lot of interviews with people, like just getting them on camera, like those three brothers we saw, whose um, father came here illegally, and now three people work for this um, sheriff's office. And again, this story came out right after inauguration, when Trump was really, really heavy on um, disparaging the Hispanic community. So that's why they were so heavy on um, <clears throat> immigration. So I wanted to dedicate the last few minutes just talking about um, FOIA and the importance of it. So number one, don't be scared to write a FOIA. Again, when I was coming up in the industry, it was like seen as something veteran reporters do. That is not true. I always feel where I work, if we had more people who want to do FOIA, it's less work for me. So please, FOIA is awesome. Um, and when, if you're interested in working on FOIA, the first thing I would try to figure out, like if you think of a story and you ask the local public, you know, PIO, whomever the spokesperson is, it, if I want this document, do I go through you or do I go through public records? And usually you have to go through public records, that means the document you want. So then um, try to figure out how to best ask for that document. So what I do is I try to talk to defense attorneys or civil rights attorneys who sort of focus on this area. So what I have up here on the screen is a story we're working on about female officers who say they were sexually harassed on the job. So it turns out if you want that information, there's actually um, state laws that are violated and federal laws if you're discriminated on the job because of your race or gender. So you can ask for like lawsuits specifically tied to this violation of like law instead of just asking for all the lawsuits. So as you learn FOIA, you'll see you want to be as specific as possible when requesting documents or data because they will deny you and saying it's too vague. So it's also learn as you go. Like I've been doing FOIA for a number of years. But when I started out, you sort of want to start getting sort of the low-hanging fruit of documents and data, then working your way up to getting more complicated, interesting things. So um, I highly recommend learning it. Any beat reporter, it's like, we need it forever. Um, so this is just an example of a document I got back. It's, again, about policing stuff. But it's a very detailed report. So as you move up on your beat, you'll learn, like, which document has this? Which document has that? So now that I've learned that, I know which document to ask for if I really want a strong, compelling police narrative about something. So it's always good to know, ask your sources, ask lawyers who cover that topic, like what's the name of this document? This is a data thing I got from the Dallas PD. We're interested in a story looking at bail and people arrested for murder. So again, you know, this is a simple thing. Just I want a list of folks arrested on murder in Dallas. That took like not even a day for them to give that to me. So again, um, don't be scared to ask for uh, data and documents. I, I think it's so important as you grow up on your beat. So the big thing I wanted to stress here, I do have a list of organizations for help as you grow up in your industry. But to me, the most beneficial to me, and again, how many people are interested in going into investigative reporting? Yeah, I'm going to plug investigative reporting really quick, because that's what I really care about. So IRE is a huge, amazing resource. Again, when I was coming up, they made it seem like only the veteran reporters can be in IRE. No, IRE is super committed these days to diversity, to helping young um, upcoming reporters get help. So I did this. It's called the IRE Boot Camp. And if you're um, a person of color or a woman, you could apply for a scholarship. And um, you get to spend a week at the University of Missouri just learning like Excel and pivot tables. And it really did help my career so much just doing IRE Boot Camp. And IRE has just so many resources. So I highly recommend if you're interested in FOIA, or data, look up the IRE Bootcamp. It's worth applying for that scholarship. 
Also, um, if you're interested in a beat, a lot of uh, education and religion, to name a few, actually have news writer associations by that beat. So it's also a good idea to join that organization. And of course, the affinity groups, if you identify as black or LGBTQ or Hispanic or Asian, there are affinity groups for that as well. But I can't stress, like I've learned the most from IRE, I'm all about IRE, so I, if you're into FOIA and data, and I hope you all are, please join IRE, yay, okay. Um, I have any questions, back to my pile of garbage. I have a question about the piece with the sheriff. Mm -hmm. So. What was your contribution to the piece, other than, of course, he was your source no, from so great many question. years ago? Were you the no. producer on that, or did you write oh, a piece I for write? the website? Did I? Yes. Investigate, <laughs> or all, or a mixture of all those things. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I wrote like a three thousand word story that ran on NBC News Hour, and. Um, the Marshall Project. I only I wanted you guys to see the video, so I helped write the script, which is you know stuff I do now at NBC, and um, you know we put together this piece, which had also cool interactives, but I felt showing you guys the video was more. Um, so there's a lot of like we made a cool like interactive slide. Were you there? Um, so that was another question, like because you had like the greatest like rapport with him because he was your source. Were you there? Physically, yes, like, I was there the whole time. You were there the whole time. <laughs> yeah, I'm not on camera. And so now this is what I do at NBC. Like, we help produce segments for nightly news. I'm not on camera. You no know, broadcast journalists have their own training. Um, I don't have that training. And um, the journalist I work with, we actually interviewed his, um, the person he took the job from. And he said, watch, I can get him to cry. And I was like, no, you can't. And um, he interviewed him. And this is a skill I don't have, like TV reporters have a skill where they can ask the pithy question, the emotional question, and he got him to cry. And the last minute he didn't want to go on camera, like we did our pre-interview with him, but I, that's a different skill set. Like I, TV people, especially on the national level, it's, they, their interviewing skills are a lot different than a print reporter, where I'm just like, where were you the night of the 15th? <laughs> they're more, <laughs> yeah, they're more into the emotional reaction, the pithy sound bite. So I was there the whole time, but no, I'm not on camera because I'm not a chain podcast journalist. Hold on. <laughs> Um, I was wondering if you could talk about at what point in your career you decided to do your, um, I don't know what your post-grad degree, oh, like college. how that meshed. And then I also want to know how you got invited to the police parties. <laughs> well, you just start showing up. Um, so uh, when I was in Philly, I was a young reporter, and I started getting really involved in juvenile justice reporting. And that's when I learned that the juvenile justice system is a lot different than the adult justice system. And I wrote this big story about a 15-year-old boy who shot and killed a 12-year-old boy and then did a story about he was on juvenile probation and why that system was broken. So long story short, UPenn at the time, and I don't think they still have it, they have a public service scholarship program. And I actually know um, NYU Law School has this too. So some graduate level, and in my case law schools, but if for what you guys cover, I'm sure there's some academic scholarship out there. They consider what journalists do a public service, so you could actually get a public service scholarship. So that's what I did. I highly look, if you're like obsessed with whatever topic, I just do public service scholarship in your topic in university to see what pops up. I quit to go to grad school and then um, went to the New York Daily News after that. Um, Hi, my name's Mina. I do some public safety related coverage and have been trying to use, you know, data requests more and also some government stuff. Um, just through your experience with requesting information, um, has there been any times where you've actually had to like either like appeal or like resubmit or like kind of fight for it? And like, I mean, I'm sure, you, like you said, you, you kind of get to know the information a little bit more and how to write the request better to get what you want. But like, I mean, like right now I'm dealing with situations where people are like, oh, we don't have that or we can't find it other than just like saying no. But like, how do you deal That's with that? That's a great question. So, um, when I get stuck, especially as a national reporter, I swoop into places and I don't know the public records law. So I did a project looking at policing in Memphis. Then I reached out. There's um, First Amendment attorneys who work pro bono with local reporters. So I paired up with this um, local attorney. We actually ended up suing for records in Memphis using um, this it's called the Reporters Committee of the Free Press as an organization that will also help you fight for records. Reporters, RCPF, Reporters Committee for the Free Press. So I worked with them on this Memphis case, and if you reach out to them, they can also try to find you an attorney in your 
state that can help you fight for records. But I'm, they usually will tell you no. And don't, it doesn't matter, <laughs> right? You just keep going. Um, but I always recommend, and my data colleagues say this too, try to find the like data nerd in the police department or the school agency. Find that person just to cultivate them as a source, because they can look it up. They can say, actually, it's called Form F. What you want is all contents of Form F. The PIO, their job is not to help you. So don't listen to what they have to say. Sometimes I also learn that the folks who deal with data are civilians, in my case, policing. So they're more likely just to talk to you on background on the phone. They're not as you know tight-lipped, like blue wall assignment. So I try to find um, either the d attorney, reach out to the Reporters Committee of the Free Press, or um, reach out to like the local data nerd. Oh, okay. Hi, um, I am interested in learning more about the dynamic and the working relationship between an investigative producer and writer and that relationship between um, the investigative reporter and what responsibilities or what, um, what work does the investigative producer do? I'm trying to bridge together the two. Are you on um, TV there. or? Yes, I'm broadcast. Okay, great. So. Um, at NBC, I think we're the largest investigative unit on the national side on television. Um, there's a track, so coming in as a reporter, some people can try to get in as a correspondent and get TV training, or you can come in and work to become a producer. So I have colleagues who can both write print pieces for NBCNews.com and can produce. And so it's just learning script writing, it's learning, I mean, stuff you already know how to do. But um, the reason why, they, with my position, they could have hired another um, investigative TV side person, and they decided to go with a print person, was sort of bringing the, I don't know, nerdier chops to it, if you will. So I'm, at this point in my career, teamed up with someone like yourself. So a project I'm working on now, I'm working with an investigative producer, and I help him like get the images he needs. So I'll put in the public records request, um, trying to get the surveillance video. We're doing a big project about um, how corporations help law enforcement in certain cases. So it's, I help him, like he goes, hey Simone, I need images from this state. So I'm putting in the public records request. Instead of asking for documents, I'm asking for video, for example. Or and I, um, when I interview sources and I feel they're really good for camera, I'll tie him into the conversation. So I see myself as sort of the first level of vetting of this person's good for TV. It's, that's what we do at my job. Like I write the written piece and I help co-produce the broadcast piece. Also, I will put in the FOIAs. So for him, he's thankful, like, I don't have to put FOIAs in for this story. They're all really busy. They're juggling um, multiple projects at a time. So if I'm anchoring one project, I'll take some of the work off his you know, plate. Then he only comes in last minute to like basically set up the cameraman. You know, he'll do the pre-interview, as you know, for broadcast. You know, they have three or four pithy questions. So he'll do the pre-interview to make sure we get those questions down for broadcast. So I, I see myself as like the first line of working with someone like yourself. Um, I have a question. Yeah. So how do you, in stories where you have to go through a PIO and like you've, you've looked up information on a particular source but you can't get their contact information, just for example, like I deal a lot with fact checking uh, COVID-19, so I have to talk to the CDC and the FDA a lot. And you have to go through ultimately, um, you know, their PIO. How do you get through the PIO, if you will, to get to your source? You That's know, a what, great question. How do you sweet talk them? Well, I, how you sweet talk, so I think it's really hard because of COVID. You can't go to a CDC like retirement party and just figure out, you know, like schmooze, like we used to do in the old days. So I do think until, you know, COVID, I don't know what the deal is with COVID, you know, we're not here in a mask, I don't know. But if things get better, I highly recommend trying to go to those events just because that's how you'll start meeting people who can talk to you on background at least. I think it's really hard coming into a beat now during COVID because why should someone take your phone call if they'd never met you before, right? It's really detrimental to them. Um, also, for those government, dealing with government sources, I always put people on Signal or WhatsApp. So if I finally get that person on the phone who really doesn't mind talking to me, I'm like, all right, we're moving the Signal. Because you have to also protect your sources as well. If they're going to leak your report or do something, they can get in trouble. And you then you get tied up too. Like, why do you have this person's report? Especially with the federal government. So insider tip, if you deal with local officials, most states have shield laws. And a shield law more or less doesn't make you divulge who gave you something. The federal side is really lax. And there's been a lot of stuff during the Trump administration 
of government officials leaking things to journalists than getting in trouble, sometimes going to prison. So especially dealing with anything federal government, I always try to get them into Signal, um, figure out um, private ways to send me information, and you should tell them like, hey, I know you can't talk to me, but I'm gonna do everything I can to protect your identity. And if they're not authorized to speak, they can lose their job. And another thing too is at, at PolitiFact, our policy is we have to be transparent with our sources, or you know, we have to be as transparent as possible. Sometimes we can say if it's like a government, like you said, um, spokesperson, you know, depending on the story, spokesperson is fine. But when you're talking to a PIO who says, who uses the word on background, and internally I'm like cringing when they say that. How do you um, talk to them and just say, hey, I really need to, you know, get you on the record. You know what? What advice would so you So I negotiate. That? This happens a lot. Um, not only, and also dealing with corporate side reporting. So they'll say, you'll hear this tip, like, you know, I heard you're smuggling bunnies. And they're like, on background, we'll say animals. And then I'm like, okay, well, I have this and this saying bunnies, and how about rabbits? And then you sort of go through this negotiation, like, I know more than you think I know, and maybe I just need you, you know, Target or the FBI or Home Depot or the Red Sox to confirm it because it's a way better story if I get this big entity to acknowledge they're smuggling bunnies. And you, I always negotiate language. And I did this story recently um, about like data and, and crimes within companies. So Target said, oh, we, I already knew from employees, they don't let us call 911 if someone's hurt, robbed in the store. So the guy was like, we don't, we, it, encourage them like not to use their phones. Like he was playing with language and like being really combative with me. So then I got my colleague on the phone and we just negotiated words. And it was like two lines in a 2,000 word story. But I wasn't gonna lose to this guy. I was like, fuck this guy. So yeah, seriously, and that's their job. Their job yeah. is to really yell at you about a word. We dealt with Amazon on a story recently and he was, the spokesman was really aggressive with us. Like, in, in, and for like word, literally one word versus two words. So their job, a really good spokesperson, will want background, and it's your job to negotiate that on record statement. We're out of time, but I hope you will share your. Yes, deck I didn't with us. make a, a the deck share, and I also didn't make a contact so slide, that which we I'm can add. pass it along to the, the sure, fellows. Sure, my pleasure. And I also hope that you'll be open to coming back, of course, talking with us. Yes. And no. to uh, fellows who may want to reach out to Yeah, I'm going to add, which I realized in this very moment, I didn't do a contact slide, so I'm going to add that in right now. Excellent. And then, um, so for those of you out there who are working on beats or want to embrace one or claim one, this, is, this has been a, a tremendous opportunity to hear from someone who's a master of her beats. Oh, thank so you. Let's give Simone. Uh, uh,